So now we're going to have a look at how the propagation of an action potential along an axon is supported by ion channels. The action potential is generated over a period of the order of milliseconds. And an action potential will develop only if there's sufficient initial depolarization of the membrane away from the resting potential. So let's suppose we're measuring the membrane potential over time at some specific point on the membrane. Initially, the potential is steady over time at the resting minus 70 millivolts. Now, suppose that something depolarizes the membrane in this location. There could be an influx of sodium ions through ion channels, for example. If this depolarization reaches a threshold level, generally between 5 and 15 millivolts less negative than the resting potential, this is the threshold at which some voltage-gated ion channels open. And there's a high concentration of these channels in the membrane along axons. So their opening collapses the membrane potential to zero, and there's even an overshoot into a positive membrane potential because of the excess of positively charged potassium ions inside the neuron that's still there. But once that positive membrane potential is reached, the sodium channels close and some potassium channels open. This rapidly pulls the membrane potential back to its resting value, again with a certain amount of overshoot, because the sodium ion deficit is fully restored, but the potassium channels are still open and the potassium ion concentration is the same on both sides of the membrane. At this hyperpotentiated level, the potassium channels close and the me membrane potential is pulled back to its resting level. So overall, there's been a collapse of the membrane potential at some point on the membrane. This collapse has been the result of a high concentration of sodium ions close to the membrane. These sodium ions diffuse away to the interior of the axon, but on the other hand, they can also diffuse laterally towards neighboring regions of the membrane. So this lateral diffusion can initiate a similar collapse in the region next door. So the collapse can propagate along the membrane, provided the densities of the voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels are high enough. And the axons of neurons have the sufficient concentrations of voltage channels to effectively propagate action potentials. Now, simple electrical conduction could carry a voltage spike, but electrical resistance would result in the signal decaying as it propagated along the axon. This partly electrical and partly chemical mechanism means that exactly the same signal reaches all the synapses at the ends of all the branches on the axon, even though one axon can have tens of thousands of branches all ending in synapses. The penalty for avoiding the signal decay is that action potentials propagate much more slowly than electrical conduction, only a few meters per second. But this speed can be increased by the presence of periodic strips of myelin coating on the axon. The action potential propagates along the axon by means of the membrane potential collapse at a succession of points, going from one small region to a neighboring small region. But when it reaches a myelinated region, the myelin acts as an electrical capacitor, carrying voltage very rapidly and initiating a membrane collapse on its far side by triggering the opening of sodium channels on the far side. So the action potential is fully regenerated in the stretches between the myelination and hops rapidly with a little bit of decay over the myelinated regions. But even after decay, the voltage is sufficient to open sodium channels at the far end. So myelination can increase action potential speed up to maybe 100 meters per second. Myelin is white and makes regions with high concentrations of myelinated axons appear white, hence the white matter in the cortex and cerebellum, for example.
axons terminate on synapses. And this is an image of an actual synapse. You can see the axon coming in at the top, and the dendrite of the target neuron is at the bottom. There's a narrow gap called the synaptic cleft between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neuron. This cleft is about 20 nanometers wide, where a nanometer is a millionth of a millimeter. Inside the red line, you can see lots of synaptic vesicles. These are containers for neurotransmitter molecules with the neurotransmitter sealed inside a membrane. Under appropriate circumstances, these vesicles move to the synaptic cleft where they release their neurotransmitter. Then molecules of neurotransmitter diffuse across the synaptic cleft in about a tenth of a millisecond and bind to receptor molecules in the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. These receptor molecules might, for example, be ion channels, as we discussed earlier. These objects are mitochondria. They're almost separate organisms. Uh, they're dedicated to providing chemical energy in the form of ATP molecules. The picture on the right also shows the synaptic cleft. And in this case, the presynaptic neuron is on the right and the postsynaptic neuron on the left. So the incoming axon is located somewhere off the picture on the far right. Once again, you can see neurotransmitter vesicles in the presynaptic neuron. But this synapse has been stained in such a way that you can also see the postsynaptic density. And as I touched on earlier, this postsynaptic density contains the molecular machinery for responding to neurotransmitter released from the presynaptic neuron and also for managing synaptic weight changes. You can also see the spine extending out from the dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron with the synapse located on the end of the spine.